Hey everyone, this is Lucy. Uh, welcome to lesson four of DevOps Bootcamp. This week we're going to be talking about security, specifically in the context of web applications and not system administration. So this winter when we do um, more focus on system administration, we will have another lesson on security, but that will be focused more on uh, securing like a data center as opposed to this, which is about creating a secure web application. So the first question that we usually ask at Dallas Boot Camp is what is blah topic? So uh, in this case, what is security? Um, generally, when we think of security, we think of just like the slide says, the state of being free from danger or threat. Um, you can also think of safety as being kind of like a synonym. synonym. Um, and so in the context of technology, we tend to think of security as being secure data. So it's not so much physical harm or bodily harm, but it's, it's making sure that our bank information, our social security number, um, all of the data that is out there on us is safe and secure. Um, there's a couple of different types of security that we talk about when we, when we talk about security in the context of technology in general. So there's the physical security of the machines that you are using. So that's things like making sure that your laptop doesn't get stolen, making sure that somebody doesn't break into your data center and plug a USB into your machine. Um, you know, the kind of security that you would maybe typically think of when you, when you think of the word security. Um, there's also software security. So that's um, how, how safe your, uh, the actual programs that are on your computer are from infiltration. So things like being resistant to viruses, um, you know, making sure that all of your data is encrypted and not just in plain text, kind of things like that. Um, and then network security is when bits are flying through the air, making sure that they are secure. So when I connect to my bank online, making sure that as my bank data goes over the wire, that it, it remains safe and people can't get to it. So uh, underneath network security, as you can see, there's kind of two different types of networking security. There's um, actively seeking out threats to uh, people's data, and then there's more passive, um, basically just like making sure that your data is staying safe, making sure that um, it, everything is being encrypted as it goes over the wire, making sure that, uh, yeah, that's really the big one, is, is making sure that stuff remains encrypted in the correct way um, as it's being transferred. Uh, so when we talk about security uh, in the context of DevOps Boot Camp, really we're going to focus on network security for most of this, just because um, as a programmer that is generally uh, where you'll be working, um, and especially as a DevOps engineer, you'll generally be on one end or the other of a network connection, either on the browser end or on the server end, and you'll be uh, making sure that people's data stays safe from uh, potential attackers. Um, so to go along with that, we have uh, a couple of different things that we uh, need to know about when we talk about what we are keeping secure. So. Um, we have this idea of authentication, which is, are you who you say you are? And is someone else who they say they are? Um, and that person doesn't necessarily have to be a human. It can be something like Google.com. So when I type Google.com into my browser, am I certain that I'm going to be going to Google.com and not to somebody's malicious site that's going to try to look at my cookies or, um, you know, something that's going to try to automatically download something. Uh, these are all kind of uh, things to be wary of. So how do you authenticate uh, as a person? So how do I make sure that when someone logs into my website, they are who they say they are? Um, and how do I make sure that a website is who they say they are? You also have this idea of authorization, which is really more about permissions. So that's saying like, okay, once I know who this person is, what can and can't they do on my website? So um, a really simple example would be um, a website where you have administrators and then you just have end users. 
So maybe you have a blog where you're the only person who can upload content, but you want everybody to be able to see your content. Um, so you would have the idea of roles and permissions and, and what are you authorized to do. Um, or maybe a better example is something that we've already worked with, which is sudo uh, or super user do. So when you say, hey, computer, I am sudo, you're saying, like, one, you're authenticating and saying, hey, I am this super user. I have these permissions. Um, and then the computer knows that you are authorized or that you have authorization to do all of the things that the super user can do. So it's another good example of authorization in the context of technology. Um, and then kind of tying these two together, we have the idea of identity and uh, really what even is identity? What makes you you? What makes you unique? Um, what gives you different permissions from someone else? Um, and then how do we verify that? Um, and that's actually a really hard question to answer, not just in a technological context, but in a broader, um, you know, how do I distinguish me from Eli or me from Evan? Uh, is it, you know, a fingerprint? Is it our face? Is it our voice? Is it this password that only I know? Um, lots of kind of tricky questions that, that there aren't really good answers out there for. So definitely something to keep in mind when we talk about security um, online. So then to go along with that idea of authentication, uh, we've all used passwords before. You guys know what they are. But um, in the context of creating a web application, we really want to think about what kinds of passwords we want our users to have and what we want to encourage them to have. So that's things like um, making sure that your uh, form has a minimum password length. And you probably want that to be about 12 to 15 characters is is usually a pretty solid uh, password. Making sure that you don't have a password cap, like a length cap that's too short. So 20 characters is probably too short. Like you want to encourage users to have uh, as long of a password as they really want. And so capping it at something like 100 um, or something that's just really outrageously long is, is really more practical than um, just 20 or, or 18 characters, which I've seen in the wild. Um, you also want to make sure that your passwords allow users to use special characters. So uh, not just things like, you know, the zero and the four and ampersand, semicolon, but things like spaces, like using a sentence or phrase as your password is one of the most secure and memorable passwords that you can possibly have. And you really want to do everything that you can to encourage your users to use that. So making sure that spaces or even tabs are valid characters in your password uh, is also something that's really important. Um, all of this is to say, like, think about what makes a good password and think about how you can encourage your users to create a good password. Um, like I said, passphrase is really one of the better words uh, that is out there. So um, even something like on your sign-up page, using the word passphrase instead of password, um, little things like that that can really make a difference in your user experience and make your user's data a lot more secure. Um, that's all I'll say about passwords. There's a lot of information out there about um, making a good password. So definitely take the time to like think about uh, both as a user and as a web application engineer, creator, um, what, what goes into making an ideal password. Um, so to go along with uh, the idea of not just creating passwords, but once they're on the server, making sure they're safe. Um, this gets a little more into system and stuff, so I won't spend too much time on it, but um, I will tell you guys that when you store somebody's password, you don't store the plain text. So if my password is I love puppies, there's not a database somewhere that has the text of I love puppies in it. What happens is someone uses a hashing algorithm to turn that sentence, I love puppies, into a fingerprint based on uh, the characters in it. And then that fingerprint or that hash is what is actually stored in the database. Um, so hashing algorithms are really cool. What they do is they take any length of text and they uh, transform it into a fixed length 
string that is hopefully unique or relatively unique to that original text. So yes, there is such a thing as collisions, but there are also collision resistant hashing algorithms, which ideally avoid as many collisions as possible. Um, the idea of assault is a random string of characters that you would append to someone's password so that even if uh, a malicious attacker was able to decrypt their password, it would still have this like random string on the end that um, could uh, confuse the hash or confuse the attacker. Um, and that was to combat something called rainbow tables. So basically what a rainbow table is, is it's a list of uh, various strings. So like iterations of just strings of characters and then their corresponding hashes for common hashing algorithms. So for example, MD5 used to be a very widely used, and in fact, I think still is, a, a relatively widely used hashing algorithm. Um, it's since been compromised, so I'd highly recommend not using it ever. Um, but people would construct these tables of pretty much every combination of characters. So like they would start with A, B, C, D, and then A, C, B, D, um, and just keep iterating like that and then have the corresponding hash that MD5 would spit out. So basically what this allowed them to do was if they did hack into a database and found a bunch of hashes, then they could look up in this rainbow table what the corresponding password was, and then your password would be compromised. So that's really the idea of a rainbow table. Um, and again, salts and more sophisticated um, hash algorithms were, were used to combat that. Um, and so I, I don't believe that they're as much of a problem anymore. Um, but definitely something to be aware of and kind of cool historical uh, knowledge. Um, so that's kind of the idea of keeping servers, uh, passwords safe when they're on a server, but how do we keep them safe when they're going over a wire? So like I said, when I'm on my bank's website and I type in my password, how do I make sure that someone's not in the middle listening um, to totally public information. Like as the bits fly through the air, they are very much public. Um, you know, how do we make sure that those stay safe? So a um, couple of things to talk about here. One is uh, SSL and TLS. So SSL stands for the secure socket layer and TLS I think stands for transport layer security, uh, I believe. And so um, basically both of those are a protocol for when a server is talking to a browser, um, you know, ensuring that that is securely encrypted. HTTPS is kind of the same idea where it's hypertext transfer protocol secure. Um, so uh, again, that's just a, a security protocol for ensuring that um, bits as they go across the wire are encrypted in a secure manner. Um, and you can't like just look at somebody's password as it is transferred from A to B. Um, so bits will be jumbled and uh, there's um, specific algorithms that are used in, in both of those protocols to ensure that uh, I can't just like look at someone's password basically. Um, and then there's the idea of a certificate authority. So we talked a little bit earlier about how do I know when I type into my browser, google.com, um, how do I know that I'm actually going to Google? And that's what certificate authorities take care of. So um, it's a little bit of a who watches the watchers question of, well, how do I trust the certificate authority? Um, and honestly, I don't have a great answer to that question, but uh, the idea of a certificate of authority is to have a central agency which verifies the identity of a website and says, okay, you know, when in this global network, when DNS resolves google.com, it is really the site that people are expecting. Um, so that's kind of the idea of a certificate authority. And we'll actually talk a little bit about that, I think, right now. Yeah, so um, we have a little bit of a quick demo for you to kind of see how you can uh, look at more information about um, how your own browser is encrypting data. 
So if you exit full screen and then uh, open up a new tab, new tab, and uh, let's actually try going to github.com, like the slide says. So go to GitHub, uh, which as you can see is using the secure HTTP protocol. And then it should have this little lock in the URL bar. So if we go up here, we can click on that. It says you're at the GitHub Incorporated. It's a secure connection. We can click this little arrow. And this will give us a really quick overview of um, the certificate that this website is using. So it's verified by this company called DigiCert which is definitely one of the more common uh, certificate authorities, at least that I've seen in um, looking at a, a few of these uh, certificates from people. So they're definitely a really big one. Um, and then a little bit of information about GitHub located in San Francisco, uh, secure connection again. And then we can click this more information. And this is really where we get a wealth of information. So. And we see that uh, GitHub's identity is verified by DigiCert. Um, we can see things like if you're storing cookies. Uh, you can also come down here and look at some of these technical details. So you can see that the connection is encrypted using this kind of lengthy algorithm. So um, there's a lot of kind of common stuff here. So TLS, we already talked about, transport layer security. Um, we also see this RSA, which some of you guys may have heard of. Uh, AES is another thing that's probably worth Googling. Uh, SHA-256, 128-bit keys. Um, basically, this is outlining how the uh, data is actually being encrypted. So uh, based, like this is what TLS or uh, HTTPS is using to uh, transform the bits as they go from your computer to github.com to make sure that uh, no one else can see them. So then uh, another thing that's kind of interesting is you can view the certificate. So this is the secure socket layer certificate uh, and you can see um, who it's issued to. Uh, this is just like a serial number. It's not a key, I don't believe, but and then we can see again that it's issued by uh, DigiCert. You can see um, how long it's good for, about two years. And then um, here are the SHA fingerprints. So that's basically what um, DigiCert uses to verify the identity of GitHub. Um, yeah, so lots of kind of interesting information. Uh, and it's sometimes kind of cool to go to you know, Twitter and Facebook or uh, even your bank and see um, kind of how they are uh, encrypting all of this data. Um, kind of so um, you guys can definitely explore more about that uh, at home on your own. So um, Take a moment maybe to pause the video here and you can, again, maybe go to a couple of other websites uh, and look at um, more of how your connection is being encrypted and, and how your websites are being verified. All right, so now we're back um, and we're gonna talk about what specific attacks are out there. So who is attacking your computer? What tools are they using? and how do you protect against that? Um, this was pulled from Wikipedia. You can see this from March of 2012, but um, I would hazard a guess that it's relatively up to date in terms of um, not having changed too terribly much in the last three years, which isn't to say that um, security hasn't become much more sophisticated, but just that, um, especially with things like cross-site scripting, like that's just really hard to defend against. SQL injection, I'm guessing that that's just a lot of really old sites, which are probably still really old. Um, now they're just three years older. Um, so we'll go over cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and this cross-site request forgery. Uh, we'll talk a lot about those three. Those are really kind of the big ones I think that you have to be aware of um, when you are creating a web application. Another really common one that you'll hear about is a denial of service attack or DDoS. So uh, what that is is when 
someone will create a whole bunch of, usually they're just robots, and they will start requesting pages from a server. And a server can only handle so much traffic. Like There are physical limits to how much data it can give to people um, in a certain amount of time. And basically, you try to overload the server until it falls over, or breaks, or shuts down, or you know something terrible happens, and then the website goes down. Um, it's really just kind of a malicious, like, there's no real point to it. As an attacker, you don't get anything out of it, but the glee of knowing that you took a site down. Um, whereas some of these, like, uh, cross-site scripting, you're actually trying to get user data, SQL injection, you're trying to hack into a database and see people's information. So, um, yeah, without further ado, so we have this idea of code injection, which is uh, basically like, how do I get my arbitrary code to run using your website? Um, and this kind of brings up a couple of uh, more universal points, which is like the only way to be truly secure is to have a computer that is completely offline. So anytime that you are talking to another computer, you are potentially at risk for being attacked. And another thing is that the browser itself and your connection to another computer is really kind of tenuous. Like, that's not to say that the, the actual pipe connecting you is tenuous. Um, TLS and SSL are uh, really pretty good at, at encrypting your bits and making sure that no one can see them. But you are uh, putting a lot of trust into your browser. When, whenever you click on something, you're running arbitrary code in the form of JavaScript. You have a lot of personal data stored in the computer in the form of cookies and cache. So um, there's just a lot, of, a lot of trust that can potentially be breached in that relationship between your browser and the server. Um, and all of these exploits are really just exploiting that trust between uh, your browser and the server. So uh, in terms of details, the idea of SQL injection is say that I have a form on a website. So let's say we're on Facebook and you're about to log in. So uh, I can either log in by saying like, oh, wyman.lucy at gmail.com, like that's my email. Or um, since I know that that email will eventually end up in a SQL query, which will be asking a database basically to verify my information, I can insert my own SQL query and say like, hey, instead of getting back like a verification that I am who I say I am, you should print all of the user's passwords to me, or you should drop a database. Um, so I know we haven't talked about SQL yet, um, but basically the idea of SQL injection is there's a language for getting data from a database. Whenever you end data into a form, it is going to end up in an SQL query, and you can format that data such that you can create the SQL query and then do really bad things to a database uh, if you know a lot about it. So if we look at this XKCD, it's actually kind of a good example. So um, this woman names her son Robert, apostrophe, and parentheses, semicolon, drop tables, students, uh, and then another semicolon. So this uh, string here is the ending of an SQL query. So she's assuming that they just want this Robert part. And then she finishes that query, starts a new query that says drop table students, and then uh, finishes the SQL statement. So she's assuming that uh, they have a table, it's named students, and that they are not properly sanitizing their data, all of which end up being true, and they end up losing the entire database of their students. Um, so this is kind of a famous, like, you'll hear about Bobby Tables, and I think there's even a website um, called Bobby Tables, which talks about databases or, or something of that nature. Um, so that's a little bit about SQL injection. The best way to protect against it is to sanitize your inputs. 
So basically that means like it's really easy to look at this and say like, oh, that's that's not someone's name. That's an SQL statement. You can look for things like semicolons, uh, apostrophes, parens. Um, and a lot of that will be built into whatever tools you use. So it's very easy to protect against SQL injection. You just need to make sure that whatever tool you're using, you're using what they provide to protect against it. So for instance, if you're making a web application using Django, I believe that they have a function uh, in their forms where you just say like, make sure that this isn't an SQL query um, and, and then poof. It's, it's done for you and you don't have to worry about that. Um, a lot of web applications will also do it automatically, which I believe Django actually might do uh, in reality. So Django will actually, without you having to tell it to, uh, check for um, things like SQL statements. But um, yeah, so just know what tools you're using, know how to protect yourself and sanitize your inputs. So then we have the idea of cross-site scripting. Uh, and so cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery are uh, easy to conflate. So I will do my best to uh, accurately describe them. However, uh, if you do have a very deep understanding of the difference between these, please forgive me if I um, do not 100% accurately uh, describe the differences between them. So. The idea of a cross-site request forgery is that you are uh, maliciously trying to escalate your privilege on a site. So that's something like, let's say I'm on Facebook. Um, I can uh, try to uh, plant an image on Facebook that will have Facebook create a get request um, and if an admin happens to click on that, then, and they have the correct privileges, then I can do something malicious with that. So, for example, let's say that um, I have an image on my site that goes to a URL that will delete a user's account. Um, and I don't have privileges to do that, but if an admin for Facebook clicks on it, then they do have privileges to do that, and they might even have that cached in their browser, and then they can delete all of the uh, all of the users on Facebook or something like that. So um, to actually maybe illustrate that with an example, let's look at, uh, they had a good one on the Wikipedia page. Um, so for example, let's say that, uh, I want to try to change the uTorrent administrator password. And I know that the URL that I need to do that is uh, something like this. So instead of localhost 8080, it would be an actual website. Um, and then that would reset the admin URL. So I don't have permissions to do that. And whenever anyone else clicks on the image, they won't. But let's say that an administrator for uh, uTorrent does actually do that, then when they click on this link, they will automatically reset their password. Um, and that's really bad because now someone else knows what your password is and then they have administrative privileges. Um, does that kind of make sense? I guess it's hard, it's hard to know since everyone's online, but... Um, this can basically be used to like set an administrator's password to something that you want instead of what they know that it is. And then through that, you can get privileges to somebody's site. So if I were to embed this on my personal site and then an admin was from Facebook or something was to come and click on it um, or even just see it, I think, then this URL, uh, It'll send a get request to this URL, which will uh, like trigger it, for lack of a better word. And basically what that means is the password will be reset to whatever I say I want it to be reset to. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the idea behind a cross-site request forgery. And I, I know that it's a lot of steps. Um, 
it's something else that is really hard to protect against, actually, because, um, again, as a user, you put a lot of trust into the websites that you visit. And it's pretty much impossible to know without looking through the actual uh, raw HTML of every web page that you visit, you know, which ones have a malicious image or a malicious link and which ones don't. So really the secret there is just to not have admin privileges on anything, but uh, you know, that's, that's of course also not possible necessarily. So um, yeah, cross-site request forgery is, is kind of a nasty uh, attack. And similarly, the idea of cross-site scripting, um, it's, it's kind of a similar idea, but a very different use case. So this is for if I actually want the user's data. So, um, you know, if Eli is just using his browser and he has a tab for his bank open, and then he opens my web page and I have malicious JavaScript, uh, then I can look at his cookies and basically download his password um, and then use that to access all of his banking information and send myself a million dollars. Um, so that's why cross-site scripting is actually so widely used is because it's really hard to detect um, it's really hard for users to know which websites are trustworthy and which ones aren't. Um, and it's just pretty easy to set up. Like all you need is, is malicious JavaScript and uh, for people to trust you. And that's pretty scary when you think about it. Um, there, that's not to say that there are no ways to protect against it. You can... Um, you can make sure that your caching is encrypted, which most browsers do. You can, uh, you know, verify that the sites that you're going to are what you think you're going to, things like that. Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, a little bit on cross-site scripting. Um, yeah, so all of these are uh, some of the more common and some of the more nasty. Uh, ways that people will execute arbitrary code uh, on your machine and then use that to do malicious things. So um, these are a little bit about web server specific attacks. And um, basically the idea here is that a lot of people run a lot of really old software. So um, I don't remember what version Apache is on for now, but the latest one that I see here, at least, is this Apache 2.2.20. And you can see that that's not even one of the more widely used versions of Apache. I guess here's 25 and 23. But um, you know, let's say there was a known vulnerability in Apache 2.0.63, which I'm sure there is um, you know, a known vulnerability that could allow you to do some really malicious things. And there's still all of these people that are using it. So, um, and this site, or this uh, graph, I think is even pretty old. You can look at the source here. Um, but really the idea here is just like, keep your software up to date. Um, that's really a more service specific thing. So again, we'll probably come back to this when we talk about system administration, but even for you as a user um, and your personal computer, like make sure that you update your software. Um, you know, yeah, just, that's really all there is to it. Make sure up to date. Um, so there's also some things that are not necessarily like, you know, well-known attacks that can work on any system, even if it's well guarded. There's also just silly things, uh, you know, problems with design and implementation that happen all the time. So things like not auth authorizing people properly, um, you know, Maybe during test, you uh, during your testing phase of your website, you automatically give all new users admin because you're sharing it with a couple of friends. It's a group project. You want to make sure that everybody has admin privileges. But like you're creating and destroying users a lot, so you you really just don't want to worry about it. And then you forget to reset that before you deploy your application. Like now, everybody who signs up for your website has administrative privileges just because of like the silly little bit that you forgot to flip. Um, and that's, you know, 
totally avoidable. Um, this one, it's harder to say like, oh, you just need to use this specific application or make sure that you include a unique token in all your requests. Um, this is really just more like really going through your code and very intentionally thinking about how is how are people's data moving through my code? Um, is everything as secure as I need it to be? Did I make sure that when I went to staging and then went to production that I made sure everything was, was secure and everything's authenticated and authorized? Um, that's really kind of what it comes down to. The idea of session management is just like when someone logs out, you know, make sure that their data isn't anywhere really on your site or uh, residual in the connection, um, things like that. So that's really kind of what the slide is about. It's just like we're all human. We all make mistakes. Um, but at the same time, things like Heartbleed uh, are just really silly uh, mistakes that could have been totally avoided if someone had just double, triple checked their code. Um, there's other attacks that aren't just code based. There's also something called social engineering. So I'm sure that we've all gotten that email from the Nigerian prince who wants to give us a million dollars. And, you know, things like, like phishing and uh, pretexting, things like that. So uh, it may seem kind of silly now, like we have all grown up in a world where these have been around for a long time and we can pretty easily spot, you know, oh, this email is, is totally valid for my grandma wanting to give me $100, or uh, no, this email's from someone who wants me to give them my bank information. Like, no, that's, that's not a thing. But I mean, your grandma might not be so aware or might not um, you know, have that cultural context of always thinking about like people are trying to get my data. And so oftentimes um, people can craft emails that look a lot like official sites. So they'll craft something that looks like it's from the government and then ask you to input your social security number. It'll say things like, hey, people will give you a call and say, hey, I am from the IRS and you owe a lot of money. And so I need you to give me your credit card and your social security number or we're going to come seize your house. Like that's something that the IRS can in theory do, I don't, but um, like that's really scary to a lot of people. And so to avoid that, they'll just give over their information without thinking twice about, is this really the IRS? Why do they need this information? Do they really need this information, et cetera? Um, so yeah, there can be some very sophisticated social engineering attacks and, um, you know, it's always kind of important to um, just be aware of that. Uh, there's also the idea of the zero day vulnerability. So that's um, like a vulnerability that basically has yet to be found. So there's zero days of people knowing about it. Um, and being the first person to find a vulnerability obviously puts you in a position of a lot of power. Do you tell the people that you found this vulnerability? The answer is yes, yes, you do. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But, um, you know, the idea of exploiting a vulnerability before it's it's been, quote, leaked to um, the rest of the world. And then even once it is leaked, before it's fixed, um, people trying to exploit it um, and just compromise data. So, yeah, zero-day vulnerabilities, also a thing. Um, yeah. So uh, we talked a little bit about the zero day vulnerability just then, but then what do you do if you do discover a vulnerability? So the very first thing, or really any bug, like we're talking about this in the context of security, so we're talking about vulnerabilities, but um, really any bug that you find in a website, like, hey, Facebook, your icon isn't displaying right, even something like that. The first thing you wanna do is test and document to verify that it exists. So make sure that it's not just, oh, I forgot to clear my cache or, oh, you know, the screen size is really weird, but when I refresh it, it gets fixed. Um, make sure that it's reproducible, that 
you know when it happens. So you can make it happen again and then you can list what conditions. So you can say, I'm on Firefox, my screen size is 700 by 920. Um, my, uh, you know, my Firefox version is this, here's what's happening. Uh, again, like if your Facebook icon is off center or something. Um, you then want to disclose it privately to those who are responsible for fixing it. So most uh, commonly used websites will have some kind of contact um, and they might even have a specific place for bugs. So Firefox, for example, has this thing called Bugzilla, which is where you would go to say, hey, I found this bug, here's what happens, here's what you need to do to reproduce it, etc. Um, and again, you want to make sure that that's private. So don't post it to Twitter, don't put it on Reddit, you know, send someone an email. Um, or again, like if they have a specific uh, place to put bugs, if they're on GitHub and they have an issue tracker, you know, make an issue, things like that. Um, you also want to provide examples. So uh, in the instance of the Facebook icon, you would probably take a screenshot and say, here's here you can see exactly what's happening. Um, or again, going back to the idea of like documenting, here's how you reproduce it. Um, so open up Firefox, go to Facebook, you know, here, again, here's my version, here's uh, my screen resolution, and then here you can see what's going wrong. Um, and then you want to give them some time to release a patch, and then uh, if they are completely unresponsive, um, sometimes the best way to get a, to get people to respond is to announce it, but it's really a last resort. Um, and yeah, something that you should do. I mean, really, it's like if it's a widely used thing and you've emailed them a couple of times and they're just not responding, not taking you seriously, um, then it can sometimes be okay to announce it publicly, and then hopefully that will motivate them to actually do something about it. And then another thing that exists is the idea of a bug bounty. So that's sometimes a company will pay people who find really big bugs um, that affect a lot of people uh, in a cash reward. So I think the biggest one ever was something like 120000 and that was actually earlier this year. Um, I want to say that Google paid it out to a couple of people who found a bug. Um, but I don't remember the details of that. But yeah, so so bug bounties are a thing where you can potentially, um, you know, if you if you get deep enough into the uh, security world and you do end up finding a really big bug, you know, you could potentially make some money doing that. All right. So should you worry as the creator of a web application? Probably not. Like. Um, you know, your school project, whatever uh, project you're working on, you know, encourage people to use throwaway passwords or, or different ones from their banking information. And then, you know, people are probably not going to attack your application. And you're also probably going to have a pretty secure web application. If you use the right tools, if you use a web application framework, um, if you do your research and make sure that people's passwords are protected, um, and make sure that permissions are all in line so um, you don't give your users more privileges than they should have. Um, it's really pretty easy to keep your ducks in a row in terms of security at a pretty small scale. Um, yeah, so, so on the small scale in terms of in the scope of DevOps Bootcamp, um, this isn't something that you have to apply too much brain to. Um, and then when you go to work for a larger company, you know, Intel and HP, Facebook, Apple, they will have a dedicated team to security and you will basically not have to worry about it ever unless you choose to go into security. Um, but as a user, this is something that you should maybe worry about. Um, you know, how secure is your data? How good are your passwords? Um, do you know what sites you're visiting? You know, are you sure that they're not running arbitrary JavaScript um, that could be malicious on your machine? Things like that. So um, as a programmer, 
you know, do you have to worry about the applications you create? No, you just have to be intentional and conscious of what's out there. As a user, you know, remains to be seen. It's up to you how much it keeps you up at night. So with that, let's head over to a to uh, the DevOps Bootcamp GitHub DevOps Bootcamp Bootcamp exercises, and we will have a security exercise up here by tomorrow night. So check that out, and yeah, have a good night, and email us if you have any questions. Thank you guys for listening. Again, my name is Lucy.